Hello, everybody. Welcome back. And uh, some of you are probably reading the title and saying, well, about time, because I know for sure we have some uh, uh, flat earthers, some F years of different kinds. So this is the show for you. Uh, and you might be a skeptic or you might be like, you guys are crazy. And this show is still for you. So stick around, guys. We got, of course, Mark Sargent with us today. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing well. And thank you so much for inviting me today. No, no, thanks for coming on, man. Like, I've been following you for, for a little bit. And, uh, you know, like I said, I first heard of you a while back, a couple of years ago, uh, black, back before any of this was a big, huge thing. And it's kind of turned into a, you could say, a phenomenon, you know, of yeah. sorts. And uh, it's really taken off. And yeah. uh, so uh, let's get right to it, Mark. Mm -hmm. You know, um, look, tell me a little bit about you. What's going on? <laughs> Who is this? Mark Sargent. Who, who am I? I am just a guy who grew up in the Northwest. I was born and raised in Seattle and started my career playing video games for a living back all the way back in the mid 90s when there, yeah, I know when there was not a lot of people playing video games for a living. I was I won a pinball world tournament back in 94 and the publisher that was out of Boulder, Colorado decided they were going to uh, hire me and so I flew out to Boulder Colorado I'd never been to Colorado before and I stayed there for 20 years uh, played video games for the first few years and then after that I taught proprietary software for various startup companies in Boulder all the way until oh boy uh, 12, 2014 pushing 2015 and that's when I kind of got into the flat earth stuff initially I started out as a conspiracy guy but but not not hardcore you know not tinfoil hat you know pull the blinds and never go out of your house type of thing I but I knew about all of them I, I was old enough to where I started way back when JFK was the movie came out in the theater back in the early 90s and up until then I, I really didn't believe in, in anything I, I I grew up on a sheltered island north of Seattle to where I, I didn't even think the people in authority would ever lie. Uh, you know, I thought things were as advertised. Right, right. And then I went into, um, I got bored. I, I knew I had a, an opinion on just about every, Lord, it's going to start cranking up here pretty soon. <laughs> some some landscapers. It's like, uh, it's going to get, it's going to get ugly. Yeah, um, true. so, I, I was I was bored w with conspiracies. I'd, I'd seen it and heard it all and had an opinion on just about every conspiracy you could think of. And everybody knows out there, everybody has heard about Flat Earth. That's what makes it so beautiful is that you don't have to... I have yet to run into a person where you, when you tell them about Flat Earth and they say, what, never heard of it. No, everybody's heard of it and everybody hates it to, to start with. And I, hate, <laughs> I, I hated it too. In 2014, yeah. I... It's in the it's it's again it's the DVD you got for Christmas you're never gonna watch it's the book the last book on the shelf you're never ever gonna read it, and it was sitting there always bugging me, it, when I was going through conspiracies it was it was just there was not much in 2014 uh, on flat Earth, and I saw this little video by a guy in Germany, about how the flight paths were screwed up in in the southern hemisphere and they didn't make sense, and it was all in German, but I got I got the gist of it where he was saying that it only makes sense if the world was actually flat, where the North Pole's at the center and all the continents are splayed outward and, and really all the oceans, we were just this puddle in the middle of a, a giant vast field. And I thought, that's kind of interesting. I go, I don't like it. I, I still think flat earth sucks, but, you know, all right, I'll, I'll go down this, this road a little bit. So... Yeah. Uh, then I watched a, a video by a, a, a Canadian guy who says he went to a, um, a, fl a, a, a NASA party down in uh, the East Coast of the United States. And that, uh, hang on, if you hear some background noise, it's going to end here pretty soon. No, no worries. Um, I also live next to an airport. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, seriously, dude. Get the heck out of here. Oh, my God. <laughs> So uh, the next thing, you know, um, I, I started digging. I said, okay, I'm going to spend a weekend on this. I'm just going to shut it down. It should not be hard to do. You know, it's flat earth, right? How, how hard could it be to stomp this thing out? And right. everybody thinks this. Fast forward to about nine months later, in the beginning of 2015, uh, February of 2015 to be exact. And I wake up in the middle of the night, and I, and I, can't, I can't solve it. It's, it's a freaking 
puzzle I cannot solve. I cannot prove the globe in a court of law anymore. And I had that weird Jerry Maguire moment where I woke up and, and said, okay, I'm going to go the other way with this. I'm going to, because I can't solve it myself, and, and I know the internet hive mind is, is very, very good and very thorough. So I made a series of videos called the Flat Earth Clues, and I, it was basically a cry for help. And put it out on the internet, I made one every day for, uh, I, well, I did seven in eight days. And, th and put them out there, and I thought for sure an academic was going to shoot it down, and they didn't. And then all of a sudden, people started calling. And where you kind of ran into it was I, I had people starting wanting to interview me, which was weird. It's like, okay. I mean, everything was unsolicited. I didn't have to call anybody. People were going, this is the most amazing thing ever. Tell me more, right? I'm going, okay. So I started talking about it. And one of the people that called me early on was Canary Cry. Right. And th and I didn't know who these guys were and, and some other people. As I'm getting into this more and more and the circles are getting bigger and bigger, it's like, oh, wow, you got on Canary Cry. I'm going, is that good? You know, is that good? <laughs> I, I didn't know. I mean, other than coast to coast, which which they called me in the first three months, I had no idea. In fact, the coast to coast interview was even more bizarre. Um, they called me up, the producer, and said, OK, um, what's your pitch? You know, what are you selling here? I go, what, <laughs> what are you talking about? And she goes, well, you know what? You know what? What? what you know, what, what's this angle? And I, I go, whatever. Um, she goes, no, no. Like, what's your DVD? I go, I don't have a DVD. She goes, how about your book? I don't have a book. She goes, okay. And she's starting to get irritated. She goes, how about your website? I'm going, and I was really embarrassed at that point. I was going, look, I, I don't, I don't have anything. I, I just have a YouTube channel. I don't have a website yet. I just started this. And she goes, why am I talking to you? And I go, you called oh me. Gosh. You called me. Why? I, I, she goes, all right, give me five minutes. Tell, give me your best pitch. And I go, all right. So I gave her the, the nickel tour. And it was the end. She's like, all right, we'll have you on next week. And it's like, okay, it, that's good, right? So, um, th and this, and it just started steamrolling. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, Rob Skiba's story because he tells me, you know, he, he does that. It's part of his thing now where he says in 2015 how I ruined his life because he was right, making right. some road trip and he heard the Canary Cry thing and he listened to it twice and then called me and says, well, I'm going to, I'm going to shut this guy down. And <laughs> yeah. then I get on his show and, and then he becomes the, probably the one of the biggest Christian advocates in the community to where right. I, I just spent some time with him down in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago when um, that we were doing the National Geographic thing. So right. anyway, yeah, that's that's the kind of the, the the short version of how I came to be where we are now. And things just started steamrolling after that to where the clues are three years old. And it is monstrous. The, the response that's out there. Heck, I just watched just last night. I, I know this is kind of, you know, anticlimactic. But last night where, you know, they had the NBA draft and the, the people that the Celtics chose or the guy that the Celtics chose uh, for Kyrie Irving, you know, because Kyrie Irving's really big into this. Uh, oh. His first tweet literally to the team was the earth is flat. <laughs> it's like oh wow this is really really something so this yeah this is interesting yeah and yeah. well let's take it back a little bit you you said about um you know the flat earth clues exactly uh -huh. and you know people in this sh this show some of the we have some of the listeners from canary cry and we also have uh also just uh our own listeners that we've gathered and stuff like that and so um what exactly does that entail like can you kind of run us through exactly the the flat earth clues and if you think you have found something more interesting or maybe what? to add on to it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I did was initially when I when I was looking at the flat earth theory, I thought it had some merit, but it was not boiled down far enough for the average person on the street. Uh, there was a lot of content out there for, for flat earth. I mean, enough, I should say. Between 2014 and the beginning of 2015, there was, a, there was several people that were, were putting forth a bunch of content. But not the if you had to give somebody a spiel like a nickel tour, there wasn't a dummy's guide. And so what I did was I made the first 11 clues pretty quickly and they covered they were basically connect the dots. There was no math, very little science. It was like it was it was kind of connect. It was kind of um, like a, a variation of an old tel British television show called Connections where I said, okay, this leads to this, this leads to this, this leads to this, and eventually all these things point at Flat Earth. 
uh, where, and I, I don't want to go over it in great detail because it would take too long, but right. what, I, what I basically said was that, look, I believe that we don't live on a spinning ball anymore. We, we've never lived on a spinning ball. We live in a giant building, a giant Hollywood back lot, a structure with walls and a floor and a ceiling. And it's so huge, so massive, that even our best and brightest didn't know for sure until about 1960 what exactly it looked like. It was that big. And we'd sent our best explorers. Basically, the, the gist was that we <coughs> knew about it. The, the powers that be knew about it hundreds of years ago. But what are you going to do? You know, let's say, again, say you're the king of Spain in 1500, right? You've got wooden ships and some horses. What exactly are you going to do? Your exploration uh, limits are, are, are really restrained. And so it really wasn't until the internal bus combustion engine came out at the, the beginning of the 1900s that we were really able to do anything, mostly, mostly with aircraft. And our aircraft advancement really, really ramped up fast. I mean, considering, you know, the Wright brothers and all those other early tests were done, you know, 1900 something. By the time we had the 1920s, we had some, you know, some decent planes. And so we sent our best guys up to the North Pole in 1926. Uh, the, the the most notable one is Admiral Richard E. Byrd. And then, again, out of the blue, from 1928 until, really, until his death in 1957, he was sent to the South Pole, or the Antarctic region, and he just flew in the Antarctic region looking for something, uh, whatever it was. And I, I, again, connected the dot and say, I think he was looking for the outer marker. Whereas he, he got to the North Pole and whatever he found at the North Pole indicated that this was some sort of building, some sort of terrarium, planetarium, God's footstool, whatever you want to call it, snow globe. So if people want to put something something visual to it, you're, you're saying something like the movie The Truman Show. Yeah, yeah, something like The Truman Show, but much, much bigger. Uh, like, a, if you, you know, The Truman Show was really just a giant sports stadium without the seats. You know, right. And we've seen this in various science fiction movies and, and even the biblical models, you know, they look sort of like that. It's kind of like a snow globey type thing. But the outer marker, they didn't know where it was. And so he flew around for the better part of 30 years. He flew his own planes, uh, military missions. Both the United States and the Soviet Union were down there. And they took a small break during World War Two and then picked it back up right after World War Two ended. And then his last mission was in 1955, 1956. It was called Operation Deep Freeze. And that's when, uh, and I said in the clues, he finds the outer marker, the outer region, the, the wall, you know, the side wall, this thing. And it wasn't, it, it had to have been thousands of miles from the Antarctic coastline. People say, well, the edge is the Antarctic. No, 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 no. The Antarctic coastline is just the beginning of the edge. The edge is so far out there. Again, our best pilots with 30 years couldn't find it. And then once he found it, that's when the world changed. Uh, and it was hidden within our normal history to where it was just glossed over. To, so when, right. what, in real quick succession, and Skiba talked about this a little bit, was in 19, so let's say they found the outer marker in 1956, 1957. Immediately the Antarctic Treaty was started to be drafted. 1958, they start launching atomic weapons, the United States and Soviet Union, straight up, trying to break through it because that's what men would do. You know, if you find a barrier, it's like, well, maybe we, how do we get through this? NASA's formed after the first three shots of those, of those atomic tests. Uh, the Antarctic Treaty is put into place in 1959, which says that no corporation in the world can set up shop in Antarctica Ever. It's the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties. It's not even up for review until the year 2041. Right. And, and speaking on that, yeah. I don't know if you've looked um, at the rules and regulations if uh, as to someone like me, that's just nobody, yeah. who wants to go over there, uh, which is you know likely not going to happen. Right. But if and when that does happen... Just to submit the application can cost like millions of dollars millions. or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah, and you and, have to go, and, th and that's just to submit it, not even to like, oh, um, uh, there's still chances that you pay that money and get declined, right? Right, right. And so, like, you have to send it. Okay, you have to send it to every 
country that's part of the Antarctic Treaty, and every country has to approve you going over there. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and yeah. Then, I it, it was amazing. Um, yeah, Rob. Rob did a, a reprint of a of a guy who went through the whole treaty with a fine tooth comb, and he, he right. was he was even saying, "No, it's worse than you can even imagine." You think right. the treat? You think the treaty's bad? No, it's really, really. It's it's a bureaucratic nightmare. Right, and then we bring we bring that up to say because you know most people would say well like well first of all most people that kind of never give it the time of day would say well how uh, how come no one's falling off the edge or whatever yeah because you know, yeah. they assume that there's an edge you yeah know? and then what the other thing is like why don't we just go to go down there and explore Antarctica you know and yeah. and obviously they don't know about the Antarctic Treaty no so. no they don't and <laughs> and again this is not to say and I, I mentioned it in the clues this is not to say that you can't go down to Antarctica if you want to spend you know the fifteen thousand dollars and go down to Antarctica you absolutely can do it uh, you know you'll have your you'll go to the coastline the peninsula you'll have your picture taken with penguins you'll go out on those bright orange rafts and wear those you know ridiculously glowingly red outfits and that's what you'll do you'll that's the, it's one of the most expensive thing trips you can ever take considering what you're doing out there uh, but as a corporation, you cannot do anything. You're saying, okay, what does that mean? What I mean is, if think about it from a resource standpoint, where if you're an oil company or uh, oil and gas or minerals, any corporation that that wants to go after the resources down there, look, oil, oil is not a cheap thing, right? But if you want to ignore it back when it was 30 bucks a barrel, that's one thing. But when it hit, goes over $100 a barrel, people are going everywhere. People are going to start fracking in your backyard. Mm -hmm. And they don't are now aren't allowed to go down there. And not only that, that's where it gets weird. They're not even allowed to talk about it. That's where I think you know because lobbying is the key to politics. You know, everybody's uh -huh. got their lobbying group, and everybody greases the palms, and they pay a lot of money for things. And yet, the biggest corporations in the world are not allowed to even talk about it. They aren't allowed to lobby about it. Uh, it's probably under the guise of national security, where every CEO that, that runs British Petro Petroleum and Exxon and all those companies, they're probably told, it's like, look, I know you want to go down there. You can't. If you try to go down there, we will bog you down with so much red tape, it, we, it will not be profitable for you in ever. And that's when the, yeah, when all these things happened was when the world changed. Uh, you know, Antar when the Antarctic Treaty and the Van Allen radiation belts were announced in the exact same year. I kind of was like, okay, I see what you're doing here. Because one of the things I was kind of trained to do uh, in my career was have uh, empathy. Because right? I did a lot of customer service, a lot of phone work, uh, it was some high, high uh, stress level clients. And right. I tried to put myself in their shoes. And so when I was looking at this, I said, okay, what would I do? If I wanted to not necessarily build the world, that's a whole nother thing. You know, but what would I have to do to try to keep it a secret? If somebody did find out, if somebody did find the edge of the world, how would you keep it a secret? And every move that the governments made after 1956, I couldn't, I couldn't come up with a better option. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's clever. Yeah, I see what you did there. And, and you know, sealing off the upper edge, sealing off the outer edge, uh, making it ridiculously expensive to even explore that area. Uh, and then militarizing space. That was, that was the other one, which was for the longest time. And you can say, well, no, there's SpaceX and Virgin Galactic and those companies. Now I'm going, yeah, but what are they really doing? I, they're, and plus they're, they're completely infested with NASA engineers. You know, they're hiring from the same pool of talent that, and that talent is, is mostly military. So, you know, we're, it's just, it was just amazing to see. So that's what the clues were. These huge connect the dots thing where I put it out there. I say, look, I think all these things point to a flat earth. Prove me wrong. And no one did. As a matter of fact, I had subject matter. I've got a long list of subject matter experts that came forward. All branches of the military, engineers, pilots, air traffic controllers, anybody that had to do with anything with transportation, the only, the brass ring, the people that, of course, have not come forward because they'd be technically whistle whistleblowers would be somebody in NASA, somebody directly tied to aerospace. Uh, but, of course, you know, they, they, they wouldn't. Uh, but no academics were willing to step forward from any physical science branch of academia to stand against this. Even now, here, here we are <clears throat> three years later, and I cannot get someone and I, I in fact i'll give you let me share a short short story with, with you real quick earlier this year 
uh, I thought I had I had thought I had somebody because I put a challenge out there called my declaration of war. I said, look, put me up against any panel at this point. I don't care who it is. I don't care what sort of degrees you have on the wall. I don't care if I'm out number 10 to 1. Put me up against them. And right. a German television team said, okay, we got a, a guy out of um, – an astrophysicist out of Georgetown. Uh, and, and would you – huh. and I said, right on. Let's do that. And, right, yeah. and he, so they <clears> said, okay, well, we're going to do it. We're going to do it really compartmentalized. So you come up with five scientific-ish questions and we're going to record you saying them on video and we will play that video for him and then he will record his own video and you guys will be doing that so you, there's, it's not going to be live i said all right that's fine that works for me in that way it's fair you know we don't have to talk over each other and so i came up with my five questions and they sent the questions to him and he folded like a card table immediately and said yeah i'm not doing this <laughs> That was wow. it. That was the end of it. And I knew it. I picked my my five best things out of all. Uh, in fact, most of them really weren't even tied to the clues, which was amazing. Uh, it was it was part of the community's thing that they came up with later. And yeah, here we are now um, to where I just got back from Los Angeles, where National Geographic flew me out to because there was a skeptics group that wanted to shoot some long distance photography and they shot it in the worst place they ever could have done. But but National Geographic, from a science standpoint, were very, very concerned about this. They know how big it's getting. And what really worried them was the U.gov report that came out just this year, where there was a British um, census taker group, uh, you know, scientific based. And they called up, I think, eight, nine thousand Americans. And they were asking them, you know, what they thought about the earth being flat. And what was weird was that the 18 to 24 year olds, about a third of them, they were on board with it. And the, and that completely skewed the curve that, that they were looking for. No play on words there mm. where they were they were And science picked up on this. And then science was like, OK, don't know what's happening. Maybe it's a fluke, but whatever's happening, you know, and they started blaming the education system and stuff. I think I'm going, no, right. no, it's because you know, younger people are more pliable. And they, it's like, okay, if enough people say this and the yeah, evidence looks pretty good, yeah, hell, why not? And so, yeah, that's where we are. Sorry, that's my ramble. No, 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 you're fine. Um, so let's go back a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about, you said, um, you know, you presented to this astrophysicist, hey, this is what's up. Give me something back, you know? Right. Can you talk about one of the things that you brought up? Because oh, up I, until I, can, now, I can give you all five. It's Okay, it's, it's, yeah, because what I, what I want to do is, you know, you know, like I said, for me, you know, I'm very open to the idea of like, yeah, okay. You know, first of all, uh, my biggest thing is to me, I'm a very big biblical context guy. Sure. You know, that's kind of what the show's about. Sure. And uh, one of the things that we talk about on the show that's a huge pet peeve of mine is when other people that believe in the Bible say the Bible says this when it doesn't say it. You right. Know, and I'm very much against that. So sure. um, even if it's not... Uh, um, uh, certain things that can be allegorical and certain things can be poetic. And I understand all those things. Right. And there's other things that I bring up and say, look, this is meant for this. This is meant for that. And um, most people in the, you know, uh, religious community uh, that believe in the Bible uh, get very triggered. Like when you say, actually, the Bible, you know, talks about a flat earth enclosed system. Sure. You know? And uh, so well, first and foremost. Well, do you, want, do you want me to get into the biblical stuff? Because I don't mind. I mean, I can, mm -hmm. I can get into that first if you, if you want me to, or do you want me to, either way, I can give you my, tell you what, let me, let me rattle off the five points I threw at this professor real quick, and then cool. we'll, we'll segue into. Yeah, let's, um, let's do that. Let's do like, because what I want to do is provide also like, uh, obviously I'll provide the links, you know, to any of the research that you have and things like that, sure. but I want people to hear, uh, scientifically what's going on like what can be empirically observed you know and and really just shown like this is this is what things look like this is this is what uh science can actually teach you if you are doing sure. empirical you know if you're going based on, on empirical data you know what i mean yep. and then from there you know we could talk about how it's presented in the religious perspective. Yeah. Sure. In fact, I'll, I'll just read the five paragraphs for you guys because normally I just I, I just give you the bullet points, but heck, let's let's, gotcha. let's do them. Um, so this is what I read to the professor at Georgetown, <coughs> uh, and then just five quick points. First, uh, and not necessarily in order of importance, but because they're all pretty good. Um, one is long distance photography. 
The mainstream science formula for the curvature of the Earth is 8 inches per mile squared. An easy comparison would be the falling rate of 32 feet per second per second. So, 8 inches per mile per mile. 2 miles is 2 times 2 equals 4 times 8 inches, or 32. 3 miles is 3 times 3 equals 9 times 8 inches, or 72 inches, and so on. At 50 miles, the curvature is 50 times 50 times 8, coming in at over 1,600 feet of curvature. And yet, with HD cameras, we can pull boats back into frame that are well beyond visual range. Not only does the new technology clearly show that it's not a mirage, but the same objects can be viewed in infrared and can be targeted ship to ship by beam radar. Can science explain this? That's the first one. Second one is vacuum versus gravity. The force of a vacuum is measured in units of tor, T-O-R-R. -R. Even a low-level vacuum can overcome gravity here on the surface. In building molecule-free chambers for the manufacturing of electronics, a series of massive pumps are needed to create a 99% vacuum environment, otherwise known as a negative 9 tor. And for the remaining 1%, Horsepower isn't enough. It can only be achieved by a chemical leaching process. That being said, how is the negative 10 tor vacuum force of space not ripping off the atmosphere of this world? Gravity is a strong force as well, but remember that there are gases that already defy it, like helium, hydrogen, and fluorocarbons. Isn't it more logical to suggest that the atmosphere is being contained in an enclosed, pressurized system? It's number two. Yeesh. I know, right? That sounds as, I mean, what do you say to that? Yeah, I know. Like, and you're scientists. I mean, and it's an old, it's an old question to science. It's like, where is the bleeding edge of the atmosphere? Where does mm -hmm. our atmosphere end and space begin? Because if you know anything about a vacuum, and I've got several guys on my on my show that were vacuum experts, they're going, look, the vacuum is no joke. It is is the equalization of pressure. If you have a massive, massive, massive negative pressure in space. The atmosphere has no chance, none. I don't. He goes. I don't care what kind of gravity, unless it's a, uh, well, unless it's a super gravity. All right, let's go into something. Um, let's do eclipse shadow. That's number three. Mainstream science tells us that the moon is over two thousand miles wide, and yet during the twenty seventeen American eclipse, the moon's shadow was only seventy miles wide, a reduction of over ninety seven percent. This is the equivalent of having a six foot man walking in front of a wall where his shadow is smaller than an action figure at only two inches high. Where do we see this in our everyday lives? We've seen shadows actual size and some much larger. Where can we see small shadows? The Flat Earth community says the moon is less than 50 miles wide, much closer, and the same size as the sun. Isn't this explanation also possible? And <laughs> I, even, I could even continue on that one. There was a variation of that, which is if the blackout zone, zone for the moon was only 70 miles wide, then when the Earth passes in front of the sun, you know, blocking out the moon, we should see a blackout zone on the moon. I mean, a total black spot of over 250 miles wide. And yet we just see a blood moon. We never see like a blood moon with a black spot. In fact, it would probably have a cool name for it because it would look like this black eye in the middle of this red mm -hmm. thing. And we never, ever see it. Uh, mm -hmm. Number four, which is an, an interesting one that I, I didn't even believe in when I first saw it, the moon temperature. Science has yet to, yet to address the relatively new discovery that the moon generates a cold light. We all know that in the daytime, it's 90 degrees in the sunlight, 80 degrees in the shade, depending on conditions. However, at night, especially when the moon is high in the sky, we see the opposite. While it might be 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's warmer at 60 degrees in the moon shade, sometimes showing temperature shifts of over 13 degrees Fahrenheit. In addition, under controlled experiment conditions, magnifying moonlight is even colder still. Again, the opposite of sunlight. We can generate this with technology today using a cold laser. The question is, why is the moon giving off a cold laser light? Yeah, I actually tried this myself when I heard, when I heard that. Yeah. Um, I couldn't believe it, though. It was a simple experiment. Uh, it was a full moon, yep. and I was waiting for the full moon right above right above us, straight above us. And what, what was the, well, what I tried was like, okay, we have a bunch of little trees in my backyard. Sure. And so, yeah, I stood in the, in the, in the moon shade and the moon shade was warmer. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And yeah. I and in the moonlight and it was colder. It was and we've colder. done some pretty neat tests where you use copper strips and water and glasses of water. One mm -hmm. was in the moon shade. One was in the moonlight and one was under magnified moonlight. And I'll be darned that magnified moonlight didn't even get colder. 
So, and, and when I first heard it, again, shows you your conditioning. When I first heard it after, in the, at the end of 2015, and I was into Flat Earth, they, and somebody told me, they called into Strange World, and they said, hey, you know, how you, what about this cold lab? Well, get out of here, cold moonlight, come on. <laughs> and, but it's so easy. The thing is, what, what ruins everybody is it's so easy to test. I mean, you go to Home Depot and you buy a freaking point-and-click thermometer for um, an infrared thermometer for like 20 bucks, not even, 17 bucks. Right. And you you know throw in a nine volt battery and poof, there you go. I mean that's again that's how how Skiba Skiba's got a great video on that. Yeah. And the last but not least, number five is the Van Allen trap question. It is a simple yes or no question. Are the Van Allen radiation belts deadly? Yes or no. If yes, then how did Apollo eleven through Apollo seventeen make round trips through these belts with only aluminum and plastic as shielding? No one died, no one got radiation poisoning, no one even got cancer. Radiation is only stopped by two metals, lead and gold. Both are very heavy and cannot be used in aerospace because of their weight. If the answer is no, the belts are not deadly, then explain the video currently on the NASA.gov website called Orion Trial by Fire, in which NASA clearly states the belts are so dangerous they will not be testing man capsules because they are unable to solve the radiation problem. Keep in mind, this is not an old video. It was literally created at the end of 2014. And and it's... I have yet to have anyone even shut any of these down. <coughs> With the exception of long-distance photography, which they'll claim is a mirage or an illusion. And I'm going, okay, well, it's it's the most magical illusion ever that's... Uh, the most high-def illusion ever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it, and it exists through ed any light conditions, of just about any distance, any weather conditions, and any object. So it's a magical mirage that, that, that can exist through all those different situations. Uh, yeah, sorry, not, not buying it. Right, right. Yeah, anyway. So I'm sure you've seen the memes out there of, uh, of like, these planets look like this, but Earth is flat for some reason, right? And then, right. then they show it in the center. So let's talk about that. What do you think about all the photography, all the pictures, all the proof we have of of all these planets that are all around and and their little moons and everything and well any anything that's i'm sorry we'll we'll start we'll start with nasa and work our way backwards anything <laughs> okay. that's anything that's put out by nasa is an utter lie there is nothing that Na everything they've done has been fabricated and people say and i know it's going to be a shock to some people because they'll say that well you know the apollo missions i you know i'm from america i believe the apollo missions were gospel uh, it's like, well, okay, think of it this way. If you're going to protect this this place, if you're going to try to keep this place a secret, what you really don't understand is that NASA was created. The entire reason they were created was to keep this thing under wraps for as long as, as, as they could. So any pictures that are released by NASA, they are created in a lab somewhere, a photo lab by somebody. Uh, that Just get that out of the way. Now, as far as amateur astronomers go, and I have talked to several, they're very upset with me where they say that look i've seen the moons of jupiter i've seen the rings of saturn i've seen well you know if you're looking from down here on the ground you're seeing a blurry fuzzy little thing of light and you, you may, may be able to take a picture of it it does look like there's saturn with rings around it and jupiter with moons around it and i say okay go to a planetarium take a pair of binoculars with you look at jupiter in the planetarium does it look more or less real and they'll say, well, that's not, it's not the same thing. You're in a building. You're in a projection. <sighs> Who's to say that you don't why when you walk out of that building, you're just not in a much, much bigger building. All we're talking about is scale here. I'm saying that the, you know, the, what you're looking up in the sky are very, very pretty lights. You know, if you want to say they're luminaries, that's one thing. You know, it doesn't really matter. What I'm saying is they're not immense objects that are thousands, if not millions of light years away. They're very, very close, and they are part of an enclosed system which is why I named the website enclosedworld.com. Okay, okay. So, what about the wonderful uh, uh, imagery and videos that we have of us landing on Mars, Mark? What about those, you know? <laughs> yeah, the Mars project. Uh, well, I mean, the manned project called, called Orion, that's going to be kicked down the road until our civilization comes to a halt. But the Mars rover... That one is super fun for me because it defies even just regular old mechanical engineering. You remember, um, in fact, I was thinking about this just recently because I had a friend's uh, car battery go dead. Your average person on the street doesn't realize that uh, the car, car batteries have a shelf life of about six, six years. 
So when you get yeah. a new car, your battery is going to go in six years. And what I mean is after about six years, maybe pushing seven, the battery eventually will not it will not be able to take a charge anymore. You, you cannot jump it. It is dead, 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 super dead. It's just a giant piece of rock at that point. It, you cannot mm-hmm. do anything with it. It's an anchor. And there's nothing you can do. And yet, the Mars rover, which apparently is still running after, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years. I, I'm not even sure anymore what year they're up to. They, th- this battery is, it just keeps going. And, and, it's, and remember, this is not a gas engine rover. This thing's completely electric powered. It's completely dependent on this battery. And it's just running around. In fact, there was a point where they had lost contact with it for an entire year. And then they, then they rebooted something, and now it's now it's back and, and doing its own thing. It's it's ridiculous. The the any footage that that's taken near Saturn, anything that's t- taken near Mars, it's all part of a a giant subtext. They don't even care if you watch the headlines. They or I'm sorry, read the article. All they care about is if you glance at the headline and maybe look at the picture, because it's all the same thing. Which is oh hey by the way there might be a face on Mars. Hey, there might be a hexagon on Saturn. Hey, we're reclassifying Pluto. Oh, uh, look, here's Jupiter's moon. Could there be life on it? Uh, it's all, it doesn't matter. All those stories are, the, the headlines aren't really important as long as you remember one thing. You're in space. Face on Mars, because you're in a, on a globe. Saturn, globe. Jupiter, globe. Pluto, you're on Earth. The whole thing. It just, it's the same thing. It's reinforce space. That's all it, it's doing because you got to remember up until the first blue marble shot of Earth, which is the four, the only uh, uh, disc picture that was taken for 43 years. There was no actual evidence that you were on Earth. The only thing that anyone ever had was those stupid plastic globe models that were sitting in our classrooms for years and years and years and years. That's all anybody had. And eventually, sooner or later, somebody had to take the picture of the Earth because you had to show somebody before the the military subcontractors started getting involved. You know, people that actually could build rockets that could go up that high. And but you can't just hand the picture of the Earth to people because what's the first question they're going to ask? How did you take the picture? So you had to create based on your military technology, you had to create a space program to at least give the impression that you could get high enough to take the picture. That part was brilliant, and then they made the mistake of trying to milk that picture for 43 years, and wasn't until we started getting involved in 2015 that they released the second picture. 43 years, one picture taken of Earth. Look it up. It's amazing. Okay. All right. Well, how about, and, you know, again, I'm just asking, trying to be the devil's advocate sure. here, because that was what Omar was here for. I, I could, understand. You know I mean? yeah. So what about... Uh, what's going on with uh, the footage we get from like the ISS? You know, same thing. Same thing. In fact, know. the ISS is even worse production value. Eh, I shouldn't say worse. Apollo was bad, but it was good for the '60s. Uh, I mean, they missed a lot of big, big things, and they and they glossed over some things that the the general public didn't didn't catch. Like, for example, let's back up to Apollo real quick. Uh, several things that weren't there. Uh, one was the stars in the background. We say, oh, that's exposure technology, and you know how the cameras set. And it's like, uh, okay, fine. Uh, you know, uh, everybody though in the conspiracy world knows you can't show the stars because remember the stars move, and you have date timestamps for you know the, when the astronauts were supposedly doing things. If the belt of Orion is in the wrong place at the wrong time, you're going to catch it. So their answer was, you know what? Let's, let's just make the whole thing black, the whole sky. Uh, two would be the shadows, intersecting shadows in the moon. That never happened. Uh, the blast crater that didn't happen. Oh, I'm sorry, no, intersecting shadows that were there. Everything should be parallel. But they were they were like there was multiple multiple light sources. The blast crater that, that didn't show up, even though there was like 10,000 pounds of thrust on this ashy area. There wasn't a speck of dust on, on anything. Uh, no feats of strength. Uh, the vertical leap, you know, remember, it's a 180-pound man that supposedly weighs 30 pounds. It should have been like uh, uh, that Disney movie where he goes to Mars and he's jumping, you know, huge, huge distances. <laughs> I mean, white man can jump on the moon, <laughs> and they didn't. I mean, yeah, they jumped a little bit. Come on, if you weighed 30 pounds, you could be, you could do amazing thing. You could lift that freaking rover with one hand if you wanted to. Um, right. But going back to the ISS, I there's so many things wrong with the production value of the ISS. Uh, first off, would be the technical component where you know because you're in a vacuum. And yet we're talking basically uh, of an airline casing, you know, aluminum and plastic. 
uh, the power of a vacuum would rip that thing to shreds. There is there's there's a reason why submarines are reinforced to, to such a degree because of crush depth. You know, a submarine gets down so far and then it, it can only go so deep because eventually the pressure gets to it. And that's working from the outside in. Think of the reverse version of that where the power of the, you know, the, the vacuum pressure difference would would shred that thing, would just blow that thing apart. Uh, I had an industrial valve and seal guy that came on and said, look, why aren't they f- shutting the doors? You know, between compartments, you realize that even if this thing was real, uh, a micrometeor the size of a nickel punches through that hole. Everybody's dead instantly. It's not like it's not like the movies where it's like there's an air leak. Somebody get the duct tape, you know, and start running around. <laughs> you don't have time. You, you literally would would exit. It would suck all the air out of that thing and your lungs instantly. It, it would. I mean, in a fraction of a second, it, 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 it'd be over. It deals, and yet there's no doors. Uh, no, everyone goes. Everyone's gliding around in their khakis and their polo shirts and socks. <laughs> Why they? Khakis and their polo. They are. That's what they're doing. They're yeah. smiling. No, I've seen they're, a, and that's that's the why I, I was going to bring it up. Yeah. Is I've seen a lot of videos from the ISS where they're like, "Hey, check it out, guys!" And they send them to schools and say, "Look, we're in space, kids." You know. Yeah. And uh, there's been a lot of you know. And if you know a little bit about how CGI works and things like that, and it, um, there's been a lot of malfunctions where you can either see the green or the blue screen, depending oh, on which one they're yeah. using, in the background. And as they move, you know, uh, it'll lose it'll lose the image for a minute. And sometimes you can even see their harnesses on their yep. on their belts. You know, there's a great video by a guy named Mike Helmick who loved. Again, it only takes one guy to start breaking down the footage, and he showed a thing where they were obviously watching CGI monitors. And saw a guy was flipping a hat, just a baseball hat, and the guy next to him was supposed to grab the hat, switch it to his other hand, and put it off on the side, on, on the wall. And he did exactly that. The thing was, he missed the hat. The hat was still there, floating in space, and for some reason, there was a, there was a glitch, and which is why you never, ever, ever do it live. Right. You never do these, even today. I mean, this is the same thing going back in show business forever. You don't do these productions live. And I know sometimes they have to because they're talking to news people or they're talking to school kids. But, oh, it was just, it was horrible. I mean, it was it was the most glaring thing I've ever seen. That and, of course, if you want to have simple fun, look up something <coughs> called ISS Hairspray, which oh, is yeah. <laughs> to, to, in order to maximize the appearance of zero G, you got to do some fun stuff with the women's hair. But at the same time, it's like, uh, I see, I wouldn't have gone that way. I would have put it, I would have had to pull their hair back, put a hat on them, a nice NASA hat, right. or whatever hat you have lying around. Or, I don't know, cut everyone's hair super, super short so the filters don't get clogged up. Because in zero G, uh, hair would be like it would be in a swimming pool. You guys would, be, people would be walking through hair particles all the time. It'd be awful. And, but right. no, instead, they perm the hair straight up. And it looked ridiculous, and it was you could bounce a quarter off their hair. It was, yeah, it, 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 and it was it was embarrassing. It was it was stuff that even your your B and C list directors in Hollywood would, would never get caught doing. I don't know why they were doing it, but all those things were uh, just uh, amazing to watch. And at the same time, we we realized as we were tearing them apart that. It was a production. Remember, in the news, it, let's go back to like movie bloopers and movie mistakes. The reasons why you, the, we have things like moviemistakes.com and moviebloopers.com is because movies are shot out of sequence to save money. You know, all your desert stuff here, all the lake stuff here, and, right. and things, things screw up. And when you go back for reshoots and touch-ups, oh, my God, they never get stuff right. And But it shouldn't ever happen in the news because the news is always real time and historical events are always real time. There shouldn't be mistakes. So once the first mistake started showing up, because now it's a social media age and we can analyze, you know, everything down to a fraction of a second in high def. Now we can find everything. And NASA had a lot of back footage (laughs) we could look through. And when we did, we found a whole bunch of loose ends that should not be there. Hmm. Well, okay, let's get into, before we get into the biblical stuff, because we mm-hmm. got to get into that as well, yeah. but uh, I'll, just, I'll just ask you, as my friend, one of my friends would ask you, but why, though, you know? <laughs> oh, no, that, no, that's a fair question. One you know, out of it, every ten people that email me or call me will ask me that. In fact, when I do the conference stuff, because I'm going to be doing Q&A 
at both the conference in Edmonton and Denver this year, that that, that question does come up. Why? Think yeah, because I mean, it seems like, okay, most people, probably the biggest thing, once you present all these facts to them, because right. I, I mean, again, I'm willing to have these conversations with people and whether you believe me or believe it or not, okay, that's fine. I, it really doesn't, it doesn't affect me where I'm like trying to force you to believe me, you know? Right. But, uh, but the thing is, one of the things that constantly comes up, even after presenting, like, okay, look, this is how this works. This is how this science experiment worked. This is how this went. Right. This is the this the crappy G- CGI that uh, that NASA puts out. This is um the Antarctic Treaty stuff. I mean, I can give go on and on and tell them all right. these different things, but they'll say like, okay, so so what? I have a yeah. I have a no. They'll say like I have a family member who works for NASA. Oh right, you know, or stuff like that. And they're like, and you know, they're she's not hiding anything. You know, like is is everybody at NASA? Is everybody at you know in the government? No, and they just are all covering it up. Every single person that works no, for NASA, even, no, no, even no. the janitor, no, like this, even the janitor is like, okay, don't tell anybody. Okay, no, no, no. This is the exact <laughs> opposite of the Manhattan Project. You know, the Manhattan Project was where the United States was trying to build the, the first atomic bomb, and we had places in different parts. We had uh, facilities in different parts of the country. One was up here in the Northwest, and there were hundreds of thousands of people that were working on this, mostly refining things, and they kept it a secret. This is not that. This is so big. This is so big that that really less is more and need to know. It could could not have a finer example in this, because it's so big it weighs on people's um, uh, minds. It wears them down. It's really really big because it changes your whole aspect of academia and science and spirituality. So does uh, do, does everybody at NASA know? No, of course not. In fact, it would be a very very small contingency which is why I always recommend the movie Capricorn 1. In Capricorn 1, only a few guys actually knew. All the wrench turners, all the people that built the rockets, all the people that wired things, they were all wiring real things. It was only the telemetry guys that knew, and only the people that hired the telemetry guys that knew. So no, very, very few, less than 1% of NASA would even have to know. Less than 1% of any government branch would have to know. I mean, does Donald Trump know? Why? Why, Why would you tell him? Exactly. Why would you tell anybody in Congress, anybody in Senate? Now, if they find out, that's one thing. You just tell them, hey, keep a lid on it, and here's why. And if you want to threaten them, you can. But usually it's such, it's so big <coughs> that they're afraid of telling people uh, because it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just massive. So, no, do all the scientists know, uh, know this? No. Uh, do all the people that run observatories? No, of course not. Um, this one is, is very, very small. And I can't even imagine there's probably levels of power that even would surprise me that don't know, because why would you tell them unless they have to like even the astronauts? I think it was different. I think the Apollo astronauts knew and then they told them Capricorn one style after after they went through the whole training process, because I think they did want to be heroes. Everybody else after that, though, were just astron- or were just uh, Air Force employees. And you sign- make them sign the disclosure agreement and say, look, you don't even have the right to ask why. No different than anything else. You, it's kind of like a spy, a spy agreement, right? You're, you're a spy. You're told to go off and assassinate somebody. You are not told why you have to do this. You're not told why you're being moved across that chessboard. You're just moving. You're, it's above your pay grade to ask. And it also helps them act naturally. So now the astronauts, again, can sit in there in their khakis and their polo shirts and their socks and float around and throw footballs and get into gorilla suits and all this other crap that they do. And they can act perfectly, you know, like nothing's bothering them at all. They know they're faking something. They just don't know why they're faking something. Now, they may suspect, but really, until a general comes to them and says exactly why, they can just put it out of their head and say, "Uh, it's probably nothing. It's probably national security. It's probably not a big deal. So, yeah, hardly anyone. Okay. I want to bring it up only because you brought it up. Uh So, what... Omar found interesting mm-hmm. because he tends to believe that there definitely is space. Yeah. Uh, is, you know, Donald Trump announcing this whole Space Force thing, mm-hmm. which really, I think, the first thing I asked myself, what are flat earthers going to say about this? Yeah. You know, and what are their thoughts and why would they be doing this, in your opinion, if, uh, in your opinion, just straight up. It's, ju- it's just another idea? it's just another drumbeat. Uh, it's <coughs> just getting space into a headline. 
that's all when you can have the president talk about space as often as you can that that is that works meaning of course there's not going to be a space force I mean, do you know how how problematic that would be okay first off it's too cheesy anyway it's 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 a cross between starship troopers and the space marines from aliens <laughs> You know, with, with Hicks and Hudson and Vasquez. And the other thing, the only reason you can't create it, I mean, he talked about kind of off the cuff, like, hey, that'd be a great idea. Maybe we'll do a Space Force. The reason why you can't do it is because no one would sign up for the other stuff. It's it it's too cool to be a real thing. You know what I mean? Why would you join the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard? Why would you join any of those things when you could be a Space Marine or whatever Space Force is supposed to be? I, I can't think of, especially in this sort of technology age, no one would no one would join anything else they, that's all everyone would immediately sign up for the the space force and then you'd actually have to do something with them and what do you mean when you're in the space force are you actually doing stuff in space even implying that there's a space force means that you're going to have hundreds if not thousands of people at one time in you know in space doing stuff which really i don't want to get off on a tangent here should have already happened because if you believed in the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union that just suddenly ended the second the United States got to the moon. And, the, and when have you seen this in any other competition where Russia just hung their heads and walked back? So, oh, we might as well just pack it up and quit. When does that happen? You, it would have gone the exact opposite. The Americans put three, they put four. We put ten, they make a small base. We make a bigger base than Time Magazine says the Cold War is now extended to the moon. That's how it was supposed to happen, and that's when the Space Force thing should have happened, but it didn't. Everybody quit. The Americans, the only ones who supposedly went there, and no one else even tried. That's the part that, that, that people just overlook. It's not that Russia and India and... Uh, uh, Europe and everybody else, China, it's not they didn't go to the moon. They didn't even try to put people on the moon, even yeah. though, it, again, one of those hidden headlines, supposedly uh, China's had their own little Mars rover thing on the moon for the last three years. But you don't see America beaming back those pictures. Why not? Because they're really, really terrible. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I get excited about this. Stuff. <laughs> no, no, no. You're good. That's, that's the kind of excitement we want around here. That's oh, fine. Good. No problem. So. No problem. No, okay. So, all right. I mean, just wanted to hear your thoughts. Oh, on yeah. That. Space really... Force is a piece of crap. There is is <laughs> never, ever, ever going to happen. Ever, ever, ever. It's too the, it, logistically. It's it's almost as problematic as uh, the Mars sending a man to Mars. They talk about the Mars. Oh yeah, the Orion Project Mars. We're going to send people to Mars. I'm going even if it was real. Even if you could get somebody in a rocket punch them that way it's a one-way trip and, and everyone knows this in the, in the space industry the problem is fuel even if space was real once they get to mars you're stuck <laughs> there's no <laughs> way you're getting back no way no way no way and so it's like oh no you know so when elon musk that's a whole other thing I, if you want to ask me about him later that's fine if, when elon musk says oh yeah we're going to colonize mars in 2030 it's like what are you talking about? Uh -huh. You're not colonizing. You can't even colonize Puerto Rico at this point. You really think, <laughs> you really think you're going to colonize Mars? Oh, it's awful. Remember, he already said that he was going to send two tourists around the moon right now, this year. He was supposed to send it around. It's like, oh, no, we, we got some delays. That's not going to really, really, even though you had no capsule, you didn't tell us who the people were. You didn't tell us who the pilots were. You didn't have a rocket. You didn't have anything. And, and you were going to send his I've never seen anyone throw out headlines that are so aggressively futuristic as him. Uh, every time he opens his mouth, it's like, how, how in the world? Uh, yeah, I know you made some billions off off of PayPal. And then you convinced people somehow that you created Tesla in, like in your garage, even though you just bought it. You just wrote them a check. And then what was the other thing he did? Oh, yeah. SpaceX. Yeah, and so everyone now now he's inviting how, all these things. How talk. dare you how dare you talk about real life Tony Stark? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and he was in a freaking Iron Man movie. Oh I saw him in Iron Man too and was going, Really? Really? Is that that's what's happening here? He's a freaking I'm sorry, he's a fraud. He's a hack. He he every time now I'm seriously when I see people on YouTube and they and they say, Oh yeah, you know, he invented Tesla, I'm going, he did not invent no. tesla he bought it mark cuban didn't invent the dallas mavericks 
All right. Ray, <laughs> Ray Kroc didn't invent McDonald's. He bought them. <laughs> oh, gosh. Sorry. Well, it shows you how much research people do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm older, so... What, yeah, what I got you. I got you. You're a little bit more um, more into doing yeah. your research. So, seasoned. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into the biblical stuff. Sure. You know, a lot of the people, like I said, uh, will, you know, the first things first. If the, As you might know, um, there's a lot of people that consider themselves literalist when it comes to believing the Bible. Right. And there's uh, what I would say, maybe, and I don't say this to be in a mean way, there's, I believe, people that are a little bit hyper-literalist, and there's literalist, and then there's, like, liberal believers in the Bible, and, and everything in between, you know? Mm -hmm. um, some people say, okay, not everything is literal, some stuff is literal, and it's uh, always a... A good conversation uh, starter between the people that believe those certain views. Um, and one of the things that, if you're honest, if you're really honest and do your due diligence, and if you're a person who believes in the Bible, uh, what does the Bible say uh, our cosmology looks like? Oh, are you asking me? Yes. I and believe what, I'll I'll go with the Hebrew one where you right. have the firmament, which is the dome up above, right. uh, the waters above that, uh, however you want to define waters, the waters below, and then a underground, ooh, boy is the word, realm where all sorts of horrible things happen and we live kind of in the middle of all that. And that the and the sun and the moon are part of the firmament depending on, on your translation and that this what well, i know they say the stars are actually part of the firmament the sun and the moon may be independent which is like what i kind of believe in um so i do follow i, I mean I've, I've compared many different uh cosmology you know from different cultures and uh I, the biblical one is as good as any i i like it a lot in fact rob steve's <coughs> Where he called it um, God's footstool, where the water was actually the last, the last defense mechanism, which I thought was brilliant. Which is, if if the civilization was actually able to penetrate it, they just sink themselves straight out of uh, straight out of Noah. And I even went so far in the clues, even though I did not quote chapter and verse, to cover my my two favorites were, uh, but I only covered one was the Tower of Babel. Which was, uh, it, you know, the Tower of Babel, you know, they create this structure because they're going to bridge, you know, the land and, and heaven. And God stopped them and, and uh, you know, t changed everybody's language and scattered them around, which, is, which was very clever. But more interesting was if the Earth is this spinning globe and it's flying around the sun and that thing and the whole solar system is moving sideways through the galaxy at an amazing speed, what exactly is the tower going to? Because if it's an infinite space, if you're just going to space, the tower is only going to go up so far. And there's just this needle on the side of a basketball that's just spinning around. And I thought that was very, very interesting. So I, I covered that in the clues. But my other one, which was, I, I thought was even cooler, was, I believe, the story of Joshua, where he asked God to hold the sun and the moon in the sky for an extra day so he could slay more enemies. And if you're looking at that from a practical physics standpoint... How easy is it, if you're God, to just stop the sun and the moon in the sky? If it's this flat, you know, if this is domed structure, you, you know, it's just part of a, the display system. It's like, oh, yeah, I can hit pause on that. Click. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's paused. Whereas if it was actually a physical heliocentric model, the the sheer forces of the physics that would, would be interrupted, you know, stopping stopping the Earth on its axis and then stopping the Earth from, from rotating around the sun, I mean, it would, it's way more, way more difficult to do that. And you say, well, God's infinite. I'm just going, yeah, but God would, would is also efficient. So I, I go with the previous. I think it was easier to stop because it was, it's all just one in case system. And he was basically just stopping or pausing a light show. Yeah, I never really thought of that, accusing God of being inefficient. So he probably would have choose the most efficient way. Because, sure, sure. I'm not, I, mean, I, mean, people, I get that argument from, from Christians quite often where they say, well, God's imminent. He can build a solar system. I go, yeah, but why? You know, mm -hmm. if 99.99% .99 of the people down here believe in the illusion, you go with the illusion because they already believe it's something else anyway. So why not? Why not go? Why, why spend all that energy and power? 
and and all that detail plus in the Carl Sagan line it's like hey there's an awful lot of empty nothingness out there why would you waste space you know why would you make this vast vast universe where there, there's nothing in most of it why not make just a, a very intimate world that's that sim that 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 act, that acts like it's something else and when i say it acts like something else let's be literal here um uh god put the sun and the moon in the sky but it was nasa that told us how big they were and how far they were away mm-hmm. so i mean nasa was you know the, they really created space right and so here here's the thing like when i when i read the bible and and um if i would suggest people that believe the Bible, believe in the bible uh, and really pay attention to the the wording, especially when you look things up um, in the original language, uh, which is something that I really suggest people to do. Uh, there's a like a cheaper version of a program called the Logos Bible Software, and you can basically look at the most ancient, updated um, translations of ancient scrolls and and look it up and see what it says. And <laughs> when I started looking up uh, things about uh, Hebrew cosmology, there would seem that there would seem to be about over 200 verses in the Bible yeah. that really just point towards this uh, um, earth that does not move, yeah. an earth that's stationary. Yeah. Uh, we have it all over Job. We have it in another incident where another prophet wanted proof of um, uh, that God you know, had a message. So he asked the person's shadow to get moved, you know, and mm-hmm. of course that would, that would include, uh, that would, that would mean that God would have to move the earth backwards, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Or her, or right. then. So that would be pretty disastrous, you know, given the laws of physics, if we're spinning at a, a very, at that speed, you know? Yep. And so again, that would be that argument. Well, God can do anything. Okay. Yes. But you know, again, it's one of those things like, I'm pretty sure God would be the most efficient decision maker. So, yeah. uh, you know, and, and things like that where, um, you know, God describes earth as a footstool, you know, himself. And he, he looks at us, you know, from above. And <clears throat> and if hey, for Mark, those people that are belong to door? this kind of community, but I think the do, most interesting the proof door? to that, uh, because they get a lot of their extra um, yeah. interview. Uh, the fringier stuff, the fringier side the, of the Bible, to get that exploded. information from the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Enoch is, I mean, very detailed as to who, how the world looks like, or the cosmology of the world looks like, you know, and uh, so that that itself again, you know, explains about the sun, and the moon having its chambers, and they go in, and they explains the whole solar system. I mean, explains how everything works and seasons and stuff like that, you know, yeah. and so uh, let's start kind of a stray away from that and you know i mean it's pretty safe to say that if you really do your your research the bible says that we are definitely in this kind of snow globe enclosed system right um and whether you want to believe that's literal or not that's entirely your choice people but that is what it says right you know? and, uh, we go ahead. And, well and yet the, every pastor that i've seen uh, that and rob Skiba will tell you this too uh that has got has gone the other way they pick and choose but they really use isaiah forty twenty two, uh he who says sitteth upon the circle of the earth they use that with veto power that's the oh, part yeah. that's amazing to me it's like okay so all these other verses are you know they they point towards a, a a flat enclosed stationary earth you know the earth does not move the earth is fixed you know and on and on and on including oh i don't know genesis the first freaking chapter of genesis talks about the firmament uh, and the, um, you know, the waters above and the waters below. And yet you're going to go to Isaiah and you're going to use that and say, nope, I'm hanging on to Isaiah. And that, that absolutely wipes out everything else. So right. really, really, that's what you do. <coughs> I mean, if, if there were 10, let's, I mean, the thing, you know, the literal part, which is had Isaiah said, he who sitteth upon the ball of the earth or the sphere of the earth or the globe of the earth. Yeah. Then maybe maybe in fact this argument would be a lot more uh, heated because then right. then you people know. that know isaiah know that or well, that they probably don't know but the word ball is used in the book of isaiah because they'll say that isaiah didn't know what a ball looked like or what yeah it was. yeah yeah so he used circle but in if you look up in the language you definitely do find him using the word for ball in hebrew 
And uh, so that's not really an argument. I mean, he knew what it looked like, but he, he chose Circle for a specific reason. You know? What about, um, the, oh, geez, there's so many little things. What, and I, you have to forgive me because I don't know chapter and verse probably as much as you. The great uh, story where uh, the, Satan and uh, Christ are sitting on top of the tallest, tallest point of the mountain. He says, look, you can see everything from here, the entire world. And it's like, how can you see the entire world if, if it's a globe? You won't be able to, in fact, you'd only be able to see a small part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, or the when during Christ's return, that every eye shall see him. Again, right. how, and I had a guy call into a show once when, when I was debating that. And he says, well, no, with smartphones, every eye will see him. I'm going, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, one, not everybody, granted, we have six billion smartphones out there. But there's lots of people out there that still don't have smartphones or televisions or anything else. There's lots of people that don't. So you can't just lean on technology for a biblical thing for, for something like this. It works on a flat world. It does right. not work on a globe. And I just – there's so many – again, Rob, Rob's uh, uh, website, testingtheglobe.com, which I'm so happy that he did. And I pointed uh, – I can't – countless people there. Uh, he go, he goes into every one again the the Isaiah forty twenty two it's like you cannot I, and I know it's in fact they're not they're not hanging on to it because they believe it they're hanging on to it because it's the only thing left to keep them from saying on the pulpit that the earth is flat because they're war they're afraid no different than the people that have interviewed me over the yeah, years yeah I mean for the most part everybody's uh, you know afraid to make Christianity look bad exactly. That's it. It's like we've come so far. It's like, really, have you? Because science has been beating you over the head for some time now. And this is your, you know, your chance to get back into it. But you're going to have to be bold if you're going to do it. You cannot, you know, if you want to rest on your laurels, hey, it's fine. That's great. But this is this is old school. This is going back to, which is why I mentioned in the in the clues. I said, you know, it was a message to all religions. I said, look, your your first impulse when this thing finally hits the tipping point is to lash out, and you you'll want vengeance against science because they have not been kind, especially right. over the last hundred years. And it's like, look, don't do it. Don't make the same mistakes we did before. You don't. You're not going to go into the universities and burn everything to the ground. Uh, you know, don't you know? No pitchforks and torches, and you know that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's still it again. It's still mind blowing, and I right, just tell right. people. So, <clears throat> I really respect like people like, for example, Michael Heiser. He's probably pretty renowned in this kind of circles of of uh, of uh, fringe Christian community as they, we've been labeled, you know. And uh, the the reason why is because you know he's a scholar when it comes to you know the Bible and things like that, and He's at least honest. He's like, look, I don't believe it. You know, I don't believe uh, what the Bible says about this, but the Bible uh, irrefutably says what it says. And then, yes, we live according to the Bible, and then the people believe that we were in this enclosed system. And I mean, if people can at least get there, I mean, that's a foot. That's a that's a foot in the right direction. I think just to be honest, it says what it says. I mean, especially I mean for Christians, uh, I would say like, look, just let the Bible say what it says, and and don't let it affect your faith because. Right. Because the the Bible's message isn't about the Earth being flat or a globe, you know. It's yeah. if, if you're concerned about that, then you're really got to reevaluate your faith there, you know. But right. uh, so, but that's a different subject. But anyways, okay. So you mentioned in the beginning of the show um, that uh, people maybe back in the day knew about it, like uh, you know, you said a Spanish conquistador. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And, King, King and, of Spain might have known, sure. And or you know. Uh, in your research from what you've seen, because I've definitely seen the video of Admiral, Admiral Byrd, uh, his interview he had on television. Right. Uh, is, that a, is that a credible source? Is that a credible video? In oh, I, I think it's absolutely credible. Um, we were lucky to get it. In fact, uh, I, was, I stumbled upon it because I was a hollow earth guy. And I, I kind of just, you know, in fact, nobody even owned the rights to it back in 2015. Somebody's bought the rights since then. <laughs> but okay. it was him going on. It was, it was released from a CBS affiliate. And it was him going on a television show. He was between missions. They were setting up for op Operation Deep Freeze, and his advanced team was already down there. And because he was the, the, the United States' greatest explorer, he'd go off and around tour. People, people want to talk to him. And remember, this is back when there was only three networks. 
And right. you know, so was, your, your television and radio time was pretty limited, but he would go around and meet people, and, and he was quite the celebrity. So he goes on this show called The Long Jeans Chronoscope, which is spelled L-O-N-G-I-N-E-S, but it's pronounced Long Jeans. And I think it was a watch company. And it was like a 60 minutes type thing. And he goes on there and he's, again, he, the, one of the reasons it resonated with me is because I think even the powers that be gave up looking. They were looking for the outer marker. It's like, how far out can we have to actually freaking fly? And they're flying. I mean, you go out a couple thousand miles. And it's like, OK, maybe they're maybe the maps are wrong or maybe the maps are missing. There's something else out there, but we can't find it. Screw it. We'll just make money. And that's what he was basically on television saying. Look, there's a whole bunch of countries down there. Everyone's kind of squabbling over rights. There's a mountain range made out of coal that could supply the entire world. There's oil. Right. There's uranium. That's what I remember most out of the video of that. There were, he said that the, the amount of natural resources would just be so beneficial to the entire oh, world. Oh, yeah. And remember, this was back when things were cheap back in the 50s. Really cheap. I mean, gas was 30 cents a gallon. It is, and and he's still saying that. Oh yeah, this place. Plus, the best part was you didn't. You, it was um, you, you didn't have to step on anything. You know, there's no plant life. There's no animal life. Uh, you no, know, it, it's just ice and snow. It, okay, let's let's just do this. And that's where they, he was basically giving an, uh, a call out to all the corporations. In fact, he was even worried. He's like, oh, you know, maybe we'll, you know it'll turn into something serious. He was actually worried that the that Soviet Union and the United States were going to start squaring off over the resources, which was kind of silly because like uh, the Cold War had barely even started at this point. And mm -hmm. remember, because we were allies in World War II right. and they were still rebuilding from World War II. Mm -hmm. And that's when, every, again, everything changed. Every That was my big turning point, which was I, I, I love looking at systems and I like looking and, and analyzing how things work. And the, this world is based on money and greed and power. Those are the, the, you know, the big underlying factors here. We all know it. We, we go to over war. We war over resources and we fight over resources and we do just about everything we do is because we want something that somebody else has. I mean, look at every war that's ever been fought in this country. This country was not carved out of peace and goodwill. You know, we right. went to war with Spain and Mexico and Britain. Uh, and who else do we have to go? Or, or, those are the three big ones just to get, you know, uh, I, every time I go down to um, every time I go to New Mexico. Uh, hang, hang on one second. Don't move. Sure. Yeah, outside the window. The um, it was not going to shut up. So, um, it, it, everything's based off of greed and power, and yet, when it came down to it, everyone abandoned that. Everybody abandoned the uh, that whole greed. I mean, it's like it, it, money all of a sudden, for whatever reason, billions and billions of dollars became irrelevant. It's, and, and I knew why as soon as I saw it, I was like, so everyone, so Admiral Burgos on that television show and he's talking about how everybody is, you know, uh, might be fighting over the resources. And then right after Operation Deep Freeze happens, they, they ran off that ice like they were on fire. And they said, not only did they run off of it, they locked, they put a big padlock. It's like, what'd you see? Like frost giants? What, what, what was out there? You know, that scared you guys and said, yeah, nobody's ever going back there ever again. And that's that's what they did. And they locked it down for all time. That goes against everything that we are as a civilization, especially in the United States. It's like, really, there's something out there bigger than money. And it, what what could that possibly be? Oh, OK. Well, the end of the world. Th that's possibly it. I mean, literally the end of the world. And that 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 to me just screamed suspicious. And then, you know, I just use that as one of the connect the dots. Right. Well, let's go back a little bit more in time. Uh, like I was saying, you know, do you, did you find any in your research uh, people that were like from that time where we were just sailing around with boats that had interesting maps or anything like that? Because I've seen that kind of circul circulate the, the, the interwebs a bit, you know, where you see like, oh, ancient map found and. It's like a flat earth um, map, you know, yeah, like there's that. a few. There was um, a, ch a Chinese or a Japanese map where there were uh, the, which showed the the AE perspective, the azimuthal equidistant perspective, and then two giant rings around it, and then continents 
all the size of like Africa, like 30 something continents around the outside of it, which was like from a thousand years ago. And I thought that was really, really fascinating. As far as our explorers, no, because all the maps were so skewed because remember, they could, they, they was tough for them to get their bearings. They, they really didn't until we had aircraft, uh, you know, our maps were, were not great. In fact, it's funny you mentioned that because like the map that we all know and love from, from school, where Greenland is massive for some reason is the Mercator map. That map's 500 years old. And even mainstream science knows that the continents are absolutely the wrong size. But it's meant for, that map was meant for, to make shipping easier, easier sailing. And, mm. and it's like, okay, so in the, the, more, the more accurate projection is the Gall Peters map. And they won't use it. It's like, they, they, so easy. All you have to do is introduce it into the schools. And for whatever reason, they won't even do that. They'd rather leave the Mercator map. It's 500 years and more people are comfortable with the Mercator map, even though the, the continent size uh, and a whole no northern hemisphere versus southern hemisphere uh, uh, way of thinking is implied there. And uh, it's, that's interesting to me. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. Let me see. I got a couple more questions, and then sure. uh, we'll get into the final deeper question, as sure. which is the why. You okay. know, we never really got uh, got got into that right there. Sure. So let's spend some time on that when towards the end right now. Okay. So one of the things that I saw that you know makes me you know at least question it, the, this whole system is like saying okay. One of the videos I saw that said, okay, flat earth debunked this, check this out. There's obviously rotation in the earth because of this. Is people were down to, you know, where it turns into the north, turn, or where it, the line is like the equator. Right. You know? Right. And so uh, apparently the water flows differently sure. on that side of, sure. of, of the equator. So, yeah. like, they would show a water funnel on one side and it was, you know, turning the opposite way and then on the other side of the equator is turning a different way yep. you know and they equate that to uh you know because it's the north and south pole and it's 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 spinning you know right, right. and so um i so what are your thoughts on that exactly my thoughts on that fall in the line okay i've got to i've got a good one for you so there's a giant youtube channel out there called smarter every day and it's uh it's run by not a flat earther and he did a story, I think a year or two ago, called Toilet Water. You can look this up if you get a chance. Uh, like, to Toilet Water is smarter every day. You'll find it. And he, because he, he had heard that thing too. It's like, hey, do, do things actually spin differently in the northern versus southern hemisphere? And so, and he had some resources to use. So he had a counterpart down in Australia do a water test where they filled up an exact, they, they both had the exact same thing, a giant kitty wading pool with a central drain it was filled all the way to the top and at the central drain and they were they were um, facetiming each other so it's on the exact same day and they waited until the water was absolutely dead stopped and then to make sure they didn't uh, disturb the water they instead of putting like little plastic boats or something on it they used eyedroppers with food coloring and they they created uh, these you know, north south east and west on there and then they pulled the plugs in the center at the exact same time and they were very gradual plugs remember identical equipment and he noticed that you know he should have seen a, a, a pretty good change you know clockwise versus counterclockwise and he didn't it was so unbelievably gradual that he he basically said look it was nominal he, he couldn't even prove he goes whatever people are saying about this drain northern versus southern he goes i can't see it and they did this test more than once and he said it's it's probably down to again it's one of those myths where people have just you know for the longest time oh boats go over the horizon oh yeah you know the drains go in the in different directions in the southern hemisphere that uh you know which is just based on how the water is going into whatever basin you're talking to be it a sink or a toilet and i thought that was really really interesting even though what i know what you're going to say you know the tourist thing at the equator is that you know they'll walk on one side of the the highway or road or whatever and you could you know they say oh no it drains this way and they walk the other side and it's a nice little novelty piece but i i don't i don't believe in that the uh, however that being said what i do believe in and other flat earthers don't is that the star trails do go clockwise versus counterclockwise at the exact equator moment. Look, I've seen the time lapse. I've seen the photographs. Anybody can take them. They can go down to the exact equator, and you can see star trails go one way, 
uh, you know, clockwise versus counterclockwise, literally in the same frame on, on, on your camera. It's like, well, how could that be possible? That part is easier. Because remember, if we're talking about a giant Truman Show, if you're talking about a giant planetarium, then you're talking about the potential of multiple display systems. Meaning in a planetarium that you go to now, the Hayden Planetarium, the New York Planetarium, whatever, it's just one display system in the middle, it's rear projection, you know, where it just fires up on the screen. But if that thing was, and we're talking what, oh, not even a couple hundred yards wide, if this thing was even 10 miles wide, you'd probably have to use multiple display systems. And if it was a thousand miles wide, you'd probably have to instance the whole thing with software which is what we've been doing in simulations for, oh, I don't know, 15, pushing 20 years. So not, it does not bother me in the slightest. The water thing, I don't buy it. The, the sky thing, I do buy, but technically, it, how, how hard an achievement would that be? You we're talking about someone that built a structure that's tens of thousands of miles wide and potentially a thousand miles high. So it, why would anything they do from a technical standpoint, be out of bounds. Okay. <clears throat> That's kind of tied to the question I was going to ask you next because uh, I, I heard an interview one time with a, a person who worked, I believe he worked on that documentary called Principal. Or oh, like it wasn't Robert Sejanus, was it? I'm not sure. I don't remember his name. But um, I do remember the person saying, like, um, he, can, he can debunk Flat Earth with one statement or something like what that. What is it? And well, it kind of based is basically is what you were talking on right now because he said that um, the on the on the north side, right. you know, on the, on the northern hemisphere, um, stars have a different rotation. Yeah, yeah, southern, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the and, southern, and, they have another rotation. And I feel bad because I actually have been in, in correspondence with it, the the lead director. It's probably him, uh, the guy that created the principle, which was Robert Sengenis. He he contacted me recently and he used a lot of the quotes that I gave him for his latest book. <laughs> which I, it's like that's fine yeah it was it was gonna happen sooner or later but he was really really bent out of shape because when the principle was released was just about the time we started getting some gas in our motor and yeah. he, <laughs> right. he was yeah. really really upset about it because he yeah. thought because one he thought we did it deliberately to submarine him and <laughs> and i know, well, you know he goes but at the same time it, uh, what I what I was trying to tell him, and I, I said this in different different emails, I said, look, you were uh, you were already saying that the Earth was the center of the universe. That was the prince the the premise of the principle. What I was just saying is, look, you just didn't take it far enough. Meaning, you you said the Earth was the center of the universe, but you still believed in space and the universe. And, but and I knew he had to do that because he was going to talk to all these different scientists, which he did. Which, and I right. thought it, I thought it was a very well done film. <laughs> Where he 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 got them to say that yeah it does appear like the Earth is the center of whatever happened in our universe. I just saying that that it's it's condensed. It's much much smaller. It's not this giant place. It's really a, a one room structure. And I know that's a big big leap for him to make. And he's he's gonna haunt. He's gonna hang on to this for as long as he can. But no, you know, sorry. The the Star Trails. You gotta remember, I used to play video games for a living, so I, I still play Warcraft, you know, once or twice a day. Just to, and <laughs> and and when you look at the sky, you understand. If you know enough developers, if you know the tech side of things, you know what can be done. The sky is easy, and and for the little thing, ninety something percent of the video games that are made out there, I don't care if it's a small thing. Uh, you know, just some stupid game or, you know, like anything from Minecraft to, to Warcraft, it's all based on a flat enclosed system. In fact, it's a giant box in, in almost all cases. Now they make the sky to look infinite and they make the, they, they, but they make the horizon perfectly flat. And that's because it's easier for the developers to do it. If the player doesn't know they're not on a globe and you just tell them they're on the globe and they believe it. So why why would you make anything harder? Why would you build a curvature formula into a video, video game? You don't have to. And the same thing, expand that out to where we are now. I, not telling you what God thinks, but I'm just saying if if the people that are here, if we don't notice that there's no curve, brilliant. <laughs> that's, that's all you need to do. And then somehow it's introduced that, oh yeah, by the way, we're, we're living on this globe that's flying through space. So don't ever, ever look for the edge. 
that's even better. And that way, again, what I talked about in the clue is where people, the, the biggest challenge was to get people to not look for the fence, to not look for the edge. And the easiest answer was to say, there is no edge. There's no edge at all because it's a ball. You're just going to go round and round and round and you're, you're never, ever going to find it, even though the edge was there the entire time. That's very, very clever. Yeah. And I've heard you speak um, on many different kinds of interviews and different things like that. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to that question. Like I said earlier, first of all, why do you think? Um, why hide it? Why hide it? Yeah. You know, why? And second, um, you obviously believe in a designer. Yeah. I wouldn't say God. I never really heard you, you know, talk about any specific uh, connection to any religion per se. But right. but you believe in a designer and a creator, yeah. uh, and he, he created this place, or you know, uh, however you want to label him. Yeah. Uh, and I guess the other question is, in your opinion, uh, if we do finally find out, like, why, in your opinion, are we here? Like, what's the Ooh. point? What, what's okay. going on? Okay. Um, the first one, yeah, because the first one's the smaller of those two questions. Uh, and I'm glad you asked the second one because I don't get a chance to answer that one much. The The first one is, is pretty obvious, which is they are... Uh, if you're the government, if you're the powers that be, if you're trying to keep this thing a secret, the reason you would do this is because you don't take chances with a very twitchy population. Meaning, we all saw what the head what happened with the headlines when uh, when the Roswell thing came out in the papers, and that was just a UFO, you know, the, that supposedly crashed in, in New Mexico, and the the, you know, the the base commander said, "Yeah, I got a UFO, we, you know, we got this thing," and you know, the papers went freaking nuts. And remember, television wasn't even really a thing back then; it was just newspapers and radio mostly. Mm -hmm. And it, the, people got really, really pumped up about this. It was, it was like the thing to talk about. Um, what might happen if all of a sudden you went to the population and you said, Hey, uh, we've been telling you about the globe for 500 years. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> mm. think, of, think of it. There's three things that would happen. Yeah, that wouldn't go over well. Potentially not. Potentially. Uh, so, so the, the obvious things, like for example, every university in every country, the astrophysics and astronomy departments, they would shut out, shut down overnight. They, they, their doors would not reopen in the morning, and every physical science outside of that, geology, hydrology, biology, archaeology, take your pick, all those would have to rebuild from the ground up. Literally, they would have to, the textbooks would have to be rewritten. That's just academia. It would be a nightmare for academia. Uh, second would be economic, world markets. What, what are the implications if the world is an enclosed system? What do people do? Do you still go to war? If you're all in the same boat, what does that happen? What does what does that mean to the defense industries? What about people that want to move closer to what they think is God? You know, do entire congregations head out and start opening up Antarctic chapters? What happens? I mean, there are so many different industries that would be touched by this that you would have to shut down world markets, literally suspend trading for months until you could figure out exactly what everything means. I mean, you know, even if a small war breaks out, it affects the, sm it affects the stock market. Something like this comes out, it, it would be pandemonium. They, they, people wouldn't know what to do. Where do you invest your money? What's safe? What, what, uh, what markets will emerge and what markets will die in a very, very short amount of time? Uh, it's, everything's pretty, even though it's chaotic and awful, it's still pretty stable, relatively stable right now. And the third and probably the most important is spirituality which is uh, the, the churches, you know, all, all the big five religions that are out there. And, and yes, I, I was raised a, um, a born again Christian, but my role in this is not, unfortunately, I can't wave the Christian flag in this. That's not what I am supposed to do, apparently. I'm supposed to, you know, put it out there to everyone. And because really, how, how can I judge? I can't just say, look, um, yeah, I was raised born again Christian, but Islam, uh, or I'm sorry, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, and Islam. Yeah, you guys. Yeah, we're. I'm. I'm not gonna. You're. You're not allowed to know this. Come on, I, I can't do. I can't do that. So, 
but think of those five religions uh, that make up what most of the population, 80% of the population in some capacity. They all now have some sort of tangible proof of intelligent design and all of them would want to know more about this. And all of them would also look at science and say, so all that hoopla you've been giving us for the last 500 years, you've been beating us over the head with your textbooks. Yeah, you were wrong about that. So what else are you wrong about? Let's mm -hmm. talk about evolution. Let's talk about the Big Bang Theory. Let's talk about dark matter. Let's talk about all this <laughs> stuff you guys have been just flapping your gums about for all these years. You can imagine the ramifications. So, so if you can imagine the, um, uh, uh, like an X Men X Files. I mean, just just people thinking about how much they've invested into these organizations. Is, oh yeah. Is, oh, yeah. I, potentially is so those those things I just mentioned to you. It's the shortest New World Order meeting ever. <laughs> it's like a, because somebody says well what's the worst that could happen Fred and then Fred rattles off all this stuff and he's going yeah we're not going to be telling anybody this for until we can figure out some sort of backup plan some sort of contingency which is I think where they are now because it, it was going to come out sooner or later it was you were never going to be able to hide this thing forever the technology was going to catch up and they did stunt the technology we did we still to this day we do not have the Jetsons technology you know, where are flying cars? Where are, you know, super high-rise cities? Where is all this stuff? Nobody's got phasers. We've got some cars that can, uh, uh, with, with, with nav system on it. And we can't even do self-driving cars right now. That's never going to happen. Boy, that's a whole other thing. It, mostly, not by the way, self-driving cars, a little tangent, not going to happen for a reason that most people miss, which is it's the insurance thing. So that lady gets run over in Phoenix, you know, by that mm -hmm. self-driving car. Yeah. Who, who pays for that exactly who pays because mm -hmm. the driver wasn't driving so you can't get him uh, is the car manufacturer is the person right. that did this the the nav in the car is it the software developers that made the nav for that car and all insurance companies their entire job is to not pay claims the 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 red tape would be forever and that's just the first person that got killed right. imagine if a and bus got hit yeah i've heard of a you know, another person um, sleeping on his during while he was driving his Tesla, or the Tesla was driving itself, and then it got into a car accident or something like that, and then he was killed or something like that. But yeah. I'm yeah. like, well, again, who, whose fault is that? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. But, I'm sorry, we again, it goes into money and power and greed right. rule everything, and it, <coughs> it, it, even though a self-driving cars technically. Uh, are 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 more efficient than we are absolutely no question i think we would actually have n less accidents the problem is is now you're asking organizations that never ever had to do this before to get into a realm which they're it's totally foreign to them so what uh, what sort of insurance adjuster do you have to hire do you have to have our software experts now as insurance adjusters what do you have to hire special uh, law enforcement officers to come to the crime scene and say okay yeah, what did the robot do this time? You know, it, it, it's it's futuristic, but it's too. There's too many people that would argue. Honestly, if you boil boil right down to it, it's the lawyer's fault. It's always the lawyer's fault. L litigation will bury us before it's over. <laughs> anyway, so to get to your last question, which is why? Forget about why was it hidden. That's easy. Why? Uh, why would God make something like this? why why are we here it is the the quintessential question of, before you get into that yeah i just want to give you my uh where sure. i stand as far as the, the the finale to all this sure because it differs quite a bit from the majority of of christians today you know okay. um probably not so much in this community of podcasting christians you know because they're a little bit more into the things that you know your average Christian won't research or look into. Sure. Okay. So when I read Genesis and when I read the entirety of the Bible and I read, um, when I've read it, and I've read it through and through and again, doing the research of the language and what, 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 what was the beginning and what was, what was it supposed to be ongoing? What's the end? What, what's the end of all? So I see, uh, to, to simplify it, I see God creating us. I see God creating this, earth put us on here this is the realm we're meant to live in 
Mm -hmm. All right. He gave us certain specific duties to carry on mm -hmm. and the ability to do it with autonomy, to do it with our free will, you know, and uh, which in a sense resembles something that he is. He is someone who does things by his choice, completely what he desi desires to design, he does, and he put that upon us. And that was happening during the time when we were in Eden, or our Edenic state. Okay. That kind of came about, uh, you know, things didn't really work out, obviously, we know about the Jesus Christ story. Mm -hmm. And, um, but what, where my, the, the story kind of changes for me when you, when, when, when you look at it more biblically, uh, people usually have this idea that, oh, you know, you accept Christ, and yes, there is salvation, and, and yes, uh, uh, an eternity uh, is kind of promised within that. It, it, not kind of, it is promised within that. But most people think you die, you go to heaven. You know, biblically speaking, that is not actually very biblical. You know, mm -hmm. uh, even if, even if you've accepted Christ. So the idea is, according to the Bible, uh, we're returning back to the original intention to go back to Eden. You know. Mm -hmm. So if you read the whole Genesis story, we had this direct connection with the Creator. Uh, there wasn't no nothing in between. You know, it's us, Him, and it, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to return back to that Edenic state. So from what I could read is the uh, humanity reaches to a, a point of enlightenment, to a point of receiving uh, the understanding of who God is and what God has done. And we are to live in a very physical manner, again, on this creation that, that he created here on earth, not in heaven. You know, when I think that gets a little bit confused, I believe strongly that where the God lives, the creator, uh, is outside of this enclosed system, outside of this uh, earth, in this realm, you could say. And that's where he belongs, and that's where, and we will not be there with him uh, the story biblically is that he will be with us and not us up there, but him again connected to us forever, you know? Yeah. And so that's where it kind of differs. You know, people have this kind of, usually you hear your <coughs> driver's Christians like, okay, we die, you accept the Christ, you go, you go to heaven. The ones who don't, you know, they go to hell. And, and that's another thing that differs slightly as well. I, I, and I wouldn't get into that one so much because, I, it, that's a very long conversation as to why I believe, you know, uh, what I believe when it comes to hell. And, and but uh, it's also it's also different, and I believe it's something that the Bible uh, is a little bit more accurate. And then obviously, it's not just me; it's coming from the sources, of course, that you know are ac academics in this kind of uh, in this kind of study. But my point being is, uh, there there's the end story is the unification of humanity, you know. But not just the unification of us, but also the unification of us together and also us to God, you know, right. and uh, I think that's where it's leading to. You can kind of, you know, put whatever for those Christians out there, whatever things in between, well, this or that, and then, and then that's fine. But when you really just boil it down and let's, let's, in a sense, do away with all the religious terminology, I believe that there's going to be, biblically speaking, um, this reunification of humans, and we're going to be in the state of awareness that we should have been in the first place that we've lost over right. time because of you know the powers that be and, and, and evil forces and, su and, and such. And um, the redemption story is going to redeem even those things, the lost knowledge, the hidden knowledge, you know. Right. And so that's kind of where I stand, just to give you kind of a platform, you know, as to uh, where you believe. No, no, it's good. Yeah. I, I think it's probably more eloquent than, than what I was going to present, which was, because remember, I, I'm trying to boil it down for, for just about anybody, which is when I looked at this world initially, uh, you know, what I was trying to figure out, okay, how do you hide it and how was it built and, uh, you know, trying to look into not necessarily the mind of God, but the little design things, you know, the, 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 the subtle genius that was in just about everything and not not going into the 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 how people were built and the biology of all living things and all that but little little things like adding i don't know adding a three percent salt solution to the oceans and what that do, does is limit the exploration travel by 90 something percent because you can't drink what you're sailing on which was the limit of which is why most of your sailing trips had to be cut short because they ran out of fresh water 
Mm -hmm. uh, little things like that or how the weather systems move in a circle around on, around that. But as far as why, I, I think you're right on, on just about every point there. When I, I looked at it, I tried, to, I tried to use more general terms. So, because the world can only be really one of three things. It can either be um, entertainment, and I don't think that's it, because if it was, a lot more people would be having a good time. It seems to be very, very conflicted. In fact, most <laughs> people aren't having a good time. They're not yeah. having fun at all, as a matter of fact. Um, but at the same time, the, other, the, the second thing would be confinement. If it's a prison, it's an awfully nice prison. There's some really, really cool things here. Uh, the, the natural processes of this world work absolutely flawlessly without us. You know, if you took humans off of this place, uh, this, it would just run great all the time. And, and you know, because there's a, not to steal from the Matrix, but that great line that, that Agent Smith said, where he said that every other life form on this planet, I know you use the word planet, uh, develops a, a natural equilibrium with its, with its uh, surrounding environment. And human beings do not. There's the exact opposite. They just consume right. and consume, and then they spread to another area. And but if it's a prison, it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like like we're we're being punished necessarily. It doesn't feel like confinement. Uh, what it felt like more than anything, the third part was education, which is a kind of felt like a school when I was looking at how it was built. And that is, yeah, sometimes you have a little fun. Most of the time, you're you're doing busy work. Uh, but all the time you're being shown things that you're supposed to be learning. And, and that was it. It's like, look, this is an education process. You're supposed to be learning things. Um, and one of the biggest things you're supposed to be learning is perspective, which is uh, one of the oldest questions of the book, and I don't want to dwell on this too much, is uh, the, the, the question that's, that people would ask God if God all of a sudden showed up. And I always disagree with the question, which is why do you let bad things happen to good people? And, the, and, and and I have an answer for that. I, and, and, it is, and, and it's usually from a, 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 a strategy standpoint, which is if bad things didn't happen to good people, then no one would be bad, meaning they would see it as an exploit, meaning you can't have, in, in fact, uh, The Simpsons did a wonderful Ned Flanders episode where all these bad things happened to Ned during like this month. <laughs> It's like his house mm -hmm. burned down and all this crap. And that's because it, because up until then, it was like nothing could ever bad happened to, to Ned because he was a God-fearing Christian and, you know, would always uh, give God credit at all times. Mm -hmm. And But you know full well, bad things happen to Christians all the time. Absolutely, yeah. And, I, and I, one of the big reasons is because if that wasn't allowed, if it was an absolute everyone would become Christian. It's like, hey, you know, nothing bad's happened to Christian. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be a Christian, too. It wouldn't be sincere. It is about free will. It is about making the choices. And the other thing is that you can't appreciate a beautiful, perfect world until you spend time in a place that's not perfect. This world, if it is nothing else, it is 99% conflict. It doesn't matter how beautiful you are, how powerful how wealthy, how talented. Everybody complains about something. Nobody is, is you know, you very rarely, do you run into somebody who yeah, says, hey, how things are going? Everything is blissful and wonderful all the time. You know, I, I, <laughs> you know, when, when do you hear that? No, it's like no. you got a, you, uh, was it um, Getty, that one of the early uh, United States millionaires, or, well, back when millionaire meant something, where uh, he had a 110 room mansion and he ripped out all the freaking phones and put pay phones in the hallways because he hated his guests making long distance calls. <laughs> he could afford it. It didn't matter. It bugged him. You know, you, right. you get used to a certain thing. It's like getting used to a hot tub. You know, once you get used to it, well, you got your, your attention is going to be focused on other things. And that's what I think this world is. You know, you, it's, the conflict is inescapable. And I think that's because outside of here, yes, there is a blissful, wonderful, and if it, if it is God coming down here and remaking the world to be perfect, hey, great, fantastic. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not against that. Uh, but that's what it feels like to me, is that we're supposed to be learning things here. And it's a school. It's an education system. It is, it is, uh, it is a teaching facility. And lots of people, uh, you know, choose to ignore it and as you know going through school there's a lot of bad students but eventually people do learn something here and there and if they have to if, they, if it's remedial and they have to go through it again hey you know what you're probably going through it again 
either sooner or later you're gonna pick up the messages that are being put out so that's my kind of meandering way of saying that yeah no no not at all um no that's it's good like i said um i believe if you um read the bible uh it's not just uh not just a how to but how to do things but also how not to do things because it's a it's a history book of how bad humanity could be, you know, and, sure. you know, one of the complaints that you hear a lot from people that are not necessarily uh, religious in, in any manner is like, look how, look how gory, look how violent the Bible is. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's primarily about human history, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not, uh, it's not an AOL Time Warner Disney production. I mean, it is not sanitized for your protection. The mm-hmm. Bible is about as gritty as they get considering what year it was, was made. Indeed, indeed. Um, so, okay, that's that answers that answers my questions. I'm sure okay. there's some people listening, like, oh, he didn't ask about this. He didn't ask about uh, that. There's but so many questions. There, there's there's can... a there's so much information on this, and, and and I challenge people, like, look, in the end, uh, both me and Omar, we're people, we're people, we hold everything with an open hand. You know, we're 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 more than, you know. Um, okay with like oh you know i'm a christian uh and i believe in this now well that's fine we can have any conversation right. we just always advise people to really do your due diligence and and especially when it comes to matters like these you know um don't write it off so quickly right. and find out actually how important things can can be something like this because that's probably one of the biggest things as well as people think well this is unimportant you know but it, it, it ties to so many things like you said it ties to mm, makes you understand about the corruption of oh, yeah. of the powers that be you know and it makes you understand uh, how it can affect a, a humanity uh, uh, just on a day-to-day basis it makes you understand uh, uh, the importance of spirituality and yeah. and people don't think that you know if that it'll affect you psychologically like how would you I think what I think you said it best how would you act if you knew you were being watched by right. somebody right you know? Yeah, would you, very... would you still be making the free will choices that normally would? Yeah, the the traffic the traffic stop argument, which is right. You you run through an intersection and then they install a camera at that intersection. You don't run through it anymore. Why not? Right. Well, because right. I'm being watched. Well, says something, doesn't it? Indeed. And so if everybody found out, like, oh my gosh, this is some giant terrarium, yeah. you know, uh, that means obviously someone designed it. That means there is a designer, and that means he is watching. Yeah. You know. And so I think people will definitely uh, think a lot different. And I also want to just advise people that, hey, especially if you're Christian, and I hear this a lot, just to be careful that you have your faith grounded in what the story is about and what God has called you to do with other people, to be loving, to be compassionate, to be, uh, you know, imagers of God. And Jesus, in many ways, set the example of... Okay, so... I think I finished my statement and then it disconnected or something. Yeah, you were yeah you were close. So yeah. Anything else? Um. Okay, let's start from there. Let me see. Okay, got you back. Lost you there for a moment, Mark. So I thought that was weird. I'm having some internet issues no over here. No worries. Yeah, but anyways, I think I summed it up pretty well. Um. And so, anything you want to just mention or want to just kind of get off that your chest that you didn't really bring up and you said oh i wish he would have asked about this or something like that uh no no i thought they were, they were great questions what i'd just like to put forward to the listeners is that look i'm not i'm not here to convince you i'm not even here to persuade you i am just putting the seed out there that you know there's something going on something new uh and yet something very very old and it's exciting and i'm just humbled to be a part of it and uh, you know, every day, I wonder where it's going, but it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and weirder and uh, very exciting. Right, right. So you mentioned, uh, just to kind of uh, bring this up because it's coming up pretty soon, and uh, you and my friend Nate, who used to be on our show, uh, went with Nat Geo, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, National Geographic. Down and, to, yeah. Uh, what were you guys doing? And I, I believe something else like that is coming up again. Uh, yeah, the so we went down to the Salton Sea because they were there was a, a little skeptics group down in Los Angeles called the IIG. I think it's the Independent Investigators Group, and they were trying to prove the curvature of the Earth. And so they invited us out to the Salton Sea, and I didn't want to go, but National Geographic was looking for a story. And so, long story short, we all got together and we spent some time out there. And the test was horrible. They they shot it over. 
uh, a very, very warm body of water, which we don't do anymore. And because of that, the Flyers community was outraged, and we're going to go back at nighttime and shoot it again on our own terms and show them that the curvature actually isn't there. What they thought was the curvature was merely heat distortion, and we've been doing this test more or less nonstop for three years, yeah, culminating in a 40-kilometer test out on a lake in Hungary that was sanctioned by the Guinness Book of World Records. And you know, it was a 100-page thing on it, which I'll send to anybody who wants it. It's not exactly like reading, but it showed what we thought. Was, Look, there's no, there's no visible curvature anywhere. And right. these guys are going to be doing it uh, <coughs> this, this coming Wednesday. Well, that's crazy. Uh, yeah. um, that's really cool. I, I remember, uh, I think uh, Nate has his own YouTube channel, and he posted something that he, that he thought was interesting. I guess, you know, they uh, they apparently found him when they... they oh, they, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. They Well, again, because it was the first time they've ever done this test, and we've done it many, many times, right. they fit, f forgot that when you're shooting over long distances, you've got to have some sort of landmarks. Otherwise, you're not, not going to know where your people are. Right. And they were looking in the wrong place. And we came back and we were, were uh, looking with our, our cameras and we saw the balloons at the beach level. And we said, oh, no, they're right over there. And they were actually give, giving us grief, saying, it was like, no, no, you, you can't be looking. You can't possibly see the balloons on the beach because they're on the other side of the curve. It's really? <laughs> it's like, so right so we're, not, we're not seeing what we're seeing. It's not actually there. And so when you point the cameras where we tell you to point, you didn't see what you... Yeah, it was ridiculous. The, the denial is strong. <laughs> yeah, that, I thought that was interesting. I think um, uh, um, Nate was there doing the whole thing with them and yeah. he, he ended up guiding them to finding them. With yeah, the yeah. without us, the test would have never happened. Yeah, they were, they were surprised, like, oh, he is there. Yeah. And, then, and furthermore, like you said, they were sp the, the, the balloons were supposed to extend up, and they weren't even extended. No, yet, right? no, they were still putting them together on the beach, and we shouldn't have seen it then. In fact, if we would have shot those cameras uh, even an hour earlier, because we were losing visibility with every 30 minutes, because the, the, the heat, you know, we're talking salt and sea. It was 105 degrees there that day. You uh -huh. know, it just keeps getting warmer and warmer. Uh, if they would have shot when they were supposed to at 5 in the morning, they would have seen it. I mean, I saw the lights. When I got to the beach, I saw the lights on the other buildings nine miles away. And yet, you know, once the, the heat got up, we couldn't even see the buildings because, you know, the distortion field just kept getting higher right. and higher. And, and I'm, I'm pointing this out to National Geographic. I'm going, look, I go, there's a mountain range in the distance. This now looks like it's an island. Well, how do you explain this? You know, this test is completely invalid, but they're going to spin it any way they want. Right. Yeah. Alrighty then. Well, I think we covered, uh, you know, not not even close to all the things that we could talk about this sure. uh, subject. But uh, we'll post some links uh, and uh, anything um, that people want to get a hold of. Uh, I mean, sorry, anything you have that you want to uh, plug, like um, what you oh, got going yeah, on. Oh yeah, yeah. Like um, just go type in Flat Earth Clues into either Google or YouTube, and you'll find me. My channel's just my name, Mark Sargent. And but, but again, you know, it's about the community. So type in Flat Earth in YouTube and just start going through pages after, you know, there's so much content out there. I envy anyone who's getting into this for the first time because there's just a wall of material you'll have to go through. Right. Yeah, there is definitely. I mean, just from when I started looking into it until now, it's like I don't even have to finish typing. it. I just put FL. Yeah. And then it just goes Flat Earth. Like there's just so many oh, different yeah, videos. It's, you know? it's, it, it's, it's everywhere. Big, Trust me when I say this, you, there are people that you know that are in the flat earth, but they won't say it. They're walking around you. We walk among you right now. <laughs> I'm going to have to get one of those glasses that reveal the true yeah, nature of you. Yeah, from, from They Live. Yeah, Yeah, from They Live and see who flat earthers are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's funny. All right, man. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, Mark. Uh, yeah. Stick around. I'm going to play some music for the folks, and uh, we'll talk a little bit after the show. All right, man.